I'm going to try and provide you with all the details required to get caught up with the rabbit hole that is Dreamworld, the most ridiculous of video game crowdfunding projects that I've ever witnessed. This story has everything a good drama needs. Romance, betrayal, child labour, nepotism, redemption, incompetence, and taking money from children. Bear in mind the footage of Dreamworld is so disgustingly bad that I will try to use it as little as possible. We will instead be using a lot of another game called Nightmare World, which is being made by another YouTuber called Callum Upton, who plays a pivotal role in the story, and the project will be explained later in the video. You are about to embark upon a magical carpet ride through the delusions of two narcissists. But first, a word from today's sponsor. I bet you've never heard of Raid Shadow Legends, have you? Well, good thing they sponsored me to tell you about the game then, right? What a way to make a living. I love this job. Have you ever been sitting around looking at your phone thinking, that awesome Kira TV video is over, what should I do now? Well, how about joining the 76 million other people that have downloaded and played Raid Shadow Legends? That's actually a lot of people. In fact, it's more people than live in the United Kingdom, which is mad to think about. I think the best part about games like Raid Shadow Legends is that you don't actually need to play them. You can just half pay attention with the auto mode ticking away in the background until you get to the part you want to pay attention to. Thanks, Raid. And if you want to get a big head start, make sure you click the link in the video description or scan the QR code on screen to get an epic hero called Chinoru, 200,000 silver, 1 XP boost, 1 energy refill and 1 ancient shard, which can be used to summon another potentially cool champion as soon as you get in game. You'll get these rewards in your inbox for the next 30 days only, so make sure you claim it and then check here once you're online. Thank you very much again to Raid Shadow Legends for the sponsor. First, I have to introduce you to our two characters. We have Zachary Kaplan, who acts as Chief Creative Officer of Dreamworld, and Garrison Bellock, the Chief Executive Officer. Zach describes himself as, and I will quote, a serial entrepreneur, and Gary describes himself as a superstar, ex-Google and Facebook engineer. Now, according to Zachary's LinkedIn profile, he has a propensity for starting his own brands and businesses, but doing absolutely nothing with them. Though he had a humble beginning in 2015 doing a three-month freelance web development job for a company called JB Matheson Incorporated, a commercial real estate agency located in San Mateo, California, that conveniently has a partner by the name of John R. Bellock, a relative to Zach's partner in crime, Gary Bellock. After that, he did odd jobs here and there as a marketing consultant for a few months to a year at a time, though the companies he worked for have almost no social media presence and the ones that do have very little interaction. He then moved on to starting his own business and brands, the first of which being titled Core Aegis. My name is Zachary Kaplan. I'm the CEO of Core Aegis Incorporated. So I think I stuck two old speakers in a backpack and started running around with it. And I quickly realized that whenever I'd stop at any intersection, um, like five people behind me would all sort of like stop with me and like look around like they didn't, <laughs> they didn't know me. Or, and uh, I realized that they were running with me because they really liked the music and they weren't wearing earbuds probably because they also realized that it was a safety hazard. A company he lists on LinkedIn as in operation for eight years since 2012, but wasn't incorporated as a company until the 1st of November 2018. Core Aegis being a speaker company whose only project is a wearable Bluetooth device, clearly inspired by the Marvel's Iron Man arc reactor and put into production to combat Zack's continued issue with running into oncoming traffic and being hit by cars due to wearing headphones. So I was actually running at NYU uh, my freshman year of college. And I was running with my earbuds in and I got hit by taxi cabs twice. Uh, and I knew I needed my music a different way. This project also had a Kickstarter with suspicious fundraising patterns that was inexplicably cancelled, and to my knowledge has yet to ship a single product to date as a sale, despite still having a fully functioning website even today. He also started a clothing brand in 2018 that lasted for two years and six months until August of 2020, which sold, quote, streetwear apparel, everything designed by Zach himself, including the website, the branding, and the clothing. Garrison Bellock has a much less colourful history. He worked for Google as an intern in 2014, Facebook as an intern in 2015, Apple for three years and two months, splitting his time across roles as an engineer on the iPhone team and a robotics engineer, before moving to Cruise as a senior robotics engineer for two years. On March 15th, 2020, Zachary would lose his job as a waiter in New York City amidst the COVID-19 pandemic. 
The information is volunteered by Zach himself during the Kickstarter promotional video that we will get to a little later. On June 1st, 2020, the Discord server first appears for the Dreamworld project, though originally the project was instead titled Elysium. This appeared alongside some other social media, including YouTube. There are only a handful of YouTube videos you can discover on the project Elysium, but most of them are unlisted. Though it is quite clear to see that this is the foundation of what would later become known as Dreamworld, and what a foundation it is. As you can see, the gameplay footage here is a project to be truly excited for. That then brings us to August of 2020. According to Zach's LinkedIn profile, this is when the Elysium project truly started to become official. Though it is named there as Dreamworld, you can see from the registration document on screen that the business of Dreamworld was not officially registered until the 3rd of March 2021. November 2nd, 2020, Zachary Kaplan, also known by the alias Wolf, appears in a now unlisted YouTube video declaring that Elysium has acquired funding by, quote, the largest investor in the world, as well as the news that the Elysium team would be going full-time in 2021 indicating the development of the project was about to ramp up and they had all the funding required to take this project from the prototype it currently was to the dream it was supposed to be. It is important to remember at this stage that they hadn't even registered their company and the game title was obviously a copyright case waiting to happen. The video to date has 265 views, most of which were acquired after the boom in Dreamworld's investigation by people enamored with the project's scam-like qualities and showed that the Elysium community was extremely small at this stage. Sometime shortly after this stage, there were some videos that appeared claiming that Elysium would be changing names due to the obvious copyright issues, but since then those videos have been entirely deleted, and shortly after this, the game would appear with the new title of Dreamworld, though it did not start to circulate with any popularity until months later in 2021. During the interim from November 2020 until March of 2021, where the story continues, Zack would spend his time divided between his multiple business ventures and advertising then Elysium now Dreamworld to as many people as he could find, using mostly popular Minecraft servers and Discord channels to do so. The main customers that he would attract to his Discord server for this ambitious project that promised the game to literally have every other game genre possible would be children and teenagers. March 17th, 2021, Kickstarter, the place where many of these stories begin, a crowdfunding website designed, as the name would imply, to crowdfund and kickstart businesses in almost any field you could imagine. A website that has been an interesting topic of conversation for gamers that are familiar with it, as there have been amazing games to release that would never have otherwise existed, jewels shining bright scattered among a pile of garbage. Dreamworld would join the trash heap on this date, March 17th, asking for a laughably low sum of $10,000, for an MMORPG that would allegedly house millions of players on a single server, a technological feat of engineering that simply does not exist yet, and a game that would be the last game you will ever play, according to their own title. The claims made were bold, the required information to make an informed decision on if this project had even a remote possibility to deliver a minimum viable product was not disclosed, such as the private investment the company had acquired, the game development experience of each team member, or the timeline of feature completed releases. But alongside this campaign came marketing, most likely put in place by Zach himself, as he had worked as a marketer for multiple years previously. Ads began to appear on websites like Facebook, directing users to the Kickstarter page where the funding was ongoing. It wasn't, however, until March 18th that the project would captivate a larger audience of bewildered onlookers. This is the part I insert myself into the story, I was the first of the MMO YouTube channels to pick up on the campaign, as I often cover Kickstarter projects to try and help people make informed decisions on purchasing games from a consumer perspective. I was made aware of the project and recorded a short reaction style video talking about how outlandish the claims were and how the project was just one gigantic red flag. Not just in terms of the extravagant innovations they claim to be bringing to the table of the tech world as an unheard of team of two, with only one of them being a developer, but due to the emotional manipulative Kickstarter video that came with the promotion. Zach would appear on camera to tell his story. And March 15th, um, COVID hit New York City and I lost my job as a waiter and this opportunity rescinded their offer. And um, my fiance left me soon after. So um, I moved back in with my parents in California and began turning my life around. <laughs> my best friend, Gary, uh, a workaholic programmer, started calling me every day to try and cheer me up. And one of the times we were talking, I, I said, you know, hey, 
why don't we just make the game we've always wanted to play? We got so excited that I made a Discord channel, <laughs> and within the first day we had Minecraft and Second Life and World of Warcraft players pouring in uh, excited about the idea of what was to become Dreamworld. And then Gary quit his job, and we added features every week, and we worked every waking hour. <laughs> and then Dreamworld went from small white box test level to a uh, medium-sized island to a massive world where players could run around, fly, resource collect, combat one another in, and build anything they could imagine in. It's been an absolutely incredible wild ride. <laughs> Dreamworld is truly my dream come true. And I am so excited to be sharing it with you. With your help, this is only the beginning. Hi, I'm Garrison. My original video covering this topic sits at 83,000 views and was the start of a movement involving dozens of smaller creators, mainstream game press outlets, massively popular YouTube channels and Twitch streamers, all digging into and discussing the ridiculous project in the delusional creator Zach. The Kickstarter page was luckily enough for almost everyone to deduce that this was not a game you would ever be excited for, and not people you should be trusting with your money. However, some people still did. Within 9 hours, the Dreamworld Kickstarter had raised 200% of their goal, resulting in more than $20,000 pledged to exchange hands from consumers to Zach and Gary for a project that was blatantly a lie. It is important, I believe, to have a callback here to earlier in the video where I said that Zach already had a successful Kickstarter for his core Aegis project, but I will reiterate here, based on the data of that previous Kickstarter, he almost definitely used sock puppet accounts or friends to fund his previous project to give the illusion of success, and then cancelled said Kickstarter so as not to incur the costs of paying himself the money and Kickstarter taking their fee, where not enough other people funded it. The project had absolutely no traction at all, with a handful of backers throughout raising organically roughly two of the $11,500 goal, and then inexplicably had a single large $10,000 donation 10 days into the 30-day campaign. The campaign would then accumulate less than $1,000 in the remaining 20 days, ending at a total of $12,879. There were no social media posts about this, no tweets with likes, no traction for this product at all, and the reason I bring this up is that he is clearly not above using such tactics to give the illusion of success and elicit fear of missing out in curious clickers throwing large sums of money at the project early on this time to create hype with the knowledge they can cancel the project should it fail to reach the desired amounts is entirely possible for these people. By the end of the Kickstarter campaign, despite the dozens of videos that had circulated about the insane claims being made and even more evidence coming to light about the people involved, they had raised $64,707. Not the craziest amount of money by any stretch of the imagination when talking about a Kickstarter game, especially when you consider this total is spread across 663 backers. And of course, other games like Chronicles of Illyria had raised over $8 million without delivering a single playable experience, but still more than it ever should have received, and there was more money coming from elsewhere. The Dreamworld team didn't just take money from the public. If you remember earlier, November 2nd, Zach would talk about taking money from one of the largest investors in the world. On March 22nd, during an interview with a backer and fan called Skiazos, the developers would talk of their private investment, totaling $650,000. Dreamworld had managed, despite at that time having not a registered business or a product with any evidence of viability, to find themselves on the extremely prestigious startup investment platform called Y Combinator, one of only a few dozen companies making a video game that had ever managed to make it through Y Combinator's allegedly rigorous vetting process. Most companies under their gaming section are gaming adjacent services like streaming services, mobile apps and storefronts. The way Y Combinator works is that you will host a seed round of funding, offering up percentages of ownership in your business for cash investment. During this round is where Dreamworld developers claim to have raised their $650,000, but it was always very unclear how much money they actually raised, and I've been privy to conversations where Zach has claimed anywhere from $300,000 to $2.2 million raised for the project to date. It varies each time he talks about it. And for an extra piece of information, I had conversations with investors who were still adamant they were going to invest hundreds of thousands of dollars additional to what had already been raised months previously during the Y Combinator seed funding round. Despite this massive wave of skepticism surrounding the project and the negative press, 
that was gaining traction every day with new information found, showing that the money raised on the Kickstarter was both inconsequential to the project's success and that investors just didn't care about the negative press. Further showing the power of that prestigious title that was bestowed upon any projects that were capable of passing the apparent strictest checks in place on the Y Combinator platform. Questions, of course, would be asked at this point, extremely valid questions such as, if you already had $650,000, why then would you open a Kickstarter with $10,000 as a goal? If you had that money already, why would you not have hired more employees in the four months since you announced it to 200 viewers on your Elysium YouTube channel, or use that money to get much further in a stage of development before showing the game to the public on the big stage, including buying ads, to get as many eyes as possible? These questions, along with any other questions, would result in your immediate ban and removal from the Dreamworld Discord server, whether you had paid money to be there or not, the only place where the team would be posting development updates, essentially meaning if you said the wrong thing, you would lose access to the information you would pay to be privy to, and many users found this out the hard way. March 22nd was also the day that Callum Upton would release his own video, showing the actual amount of effort and work put into the Dreamworld game that they'd showed earlier in the trailer, including all the asset packs they were using in the trailer, and showing how the campaign also came with another fun little feature, the hidden operation of acting almost like a shady multi-level marketing scheme, Essentially, if you wanted access to play the alpha version, backing the game was not enough. Giving them money was not enough. You must also recruit two friends with you, meaning you had to rope other victims in with you or be unable to play the game. In the next month, the information is way too much to chronicle by dates. Every day, something new was releasing. I had conversations with people who knew these individuals for many years, confirming that almost everything said by Zach in the Kickstarter video was at the most generous an exaggeration bordering on fabrication and at worst delusional ramblings and lies, including the sob story that he sold his Kickstarter with, that his fiance had left him after he lost his job during COVID. The story I heard went more along the lines of this. He bought her a fake engagement ring and lied to her for the better part of a year about it being fake and gaslit her the whole time while living with her parents who would pay him money to do odd jobs around the house until she finally dumped him for being, in her own words, manipulative. By April 9th, 2021, the Kickstarter had ended, and it only got worse in terms of the information pouring out. Much like a dam built by rats pretending to be beavers, the Dreamworld developers had done very little to contain the tide of bullshit that was building, ready to explode. YouTubers like Callum Upton were breaking down Kickstarter terms of service and technical aspects that didn't add up, as well as showcasing just how easy it was to put together the things the developers had shown in their Kickstarter trailer. Josh Strife Hayes was covering the information in his usual concise and informative way, breaking down all the information gleaned so far with mug in hand. Some of the highlights from this period of time being that when looking through the Kickstarter, you would notice they never actually state that you're paying for a full game, and the rewards you earn for backing the game only include alpha access, meaning in terms of legal liability, so long as they give you any product that says Dreamworld Alpha, they can make the argument they delivered on what people paid for. And when asked to clarify on this point, they state that there is more information available on the Discord server, which essentially answers your question publicly with a call to action, to come into the Discord server where you would ask the same question and likely be banned for doing so, while not actually giving a response that should be very simple, requiring many less words, yes, we intend to deliver a full game. But of course, saying that would make their liability to do so much more apparent. On April 20th, my previous leak detailing the situation with Zach and his fiance was confirmed by someone posting screenshots of a private conversation they had with the ex-fiancé in question. Unfortunately, this person did not get permission from the fiancé to share said screenshots, so when I used them in my video, it was unfortunately without her knowledge that they were shared in the public domain, though she did make the best of the situation and released her very own tell-all video on April 21st, where she would explain in excruciating detail the lies and manipulations of Zach during the turbulent year or more before the breakdown of their relationship including the story of how he surprised her by showing up on her modelling big break red carpet event with a huge diamond ring in hand to propose in front of all the cameras like a romantic comedy, to which she asked later in private, Oh my god, like, is this real? And he told me yes. Then months down the line, she would go to have it resized and find that to be completely untrue. The ring was of such bad quality that if they tried to resize it, it would literally disintegrate. And I don't mean like moissanite fake, I mean like they literally couldn't resize the ring 
to fit my finger because it would have entirely melted. When confronted with said information, Zach would spin a story. He gave me this whole roundabout answer that, uh, to summarize, was that he thought it was real when he purchased it, but he wasn't actually charged the price of a real ring. Even eventually spinning an elaborate story about the girl at the shop being fired for selling other people fake jewellery. The woman who actually sold him the ring had been fired because she had actually misled other customers in this way in the past and so she was already fired um and then of course i asked like how did you not notice that like you weren't charged for the real price of a real ring like that's a big difference and he gave me some convoluted answer about how like his dad had made transactions in that bank account the same day that he was charged for the ring so he only paid attention to the like overall amount and so before later admitting that he did indeed buy her a fake ring, and why did she even deserve a diamond ring? He also started saying things like, well, why do you deserve a diamond? Or why do I have to buy you a diamond? And things like that. And again, it was really like he was just ignoring the real problem, which was that I was upset that he lied to me. She stayed with him for months after losing his job, despite him lying to her and manipulating her for those months. And she also claimed that during the years she was with Zach, she was unaware of any programming or game development experience he would have, despite him claiming in unpublished sections of the Dreamworld website that he had eight years of game development experience. Nine years of game dev experience, and he asked for some proof. And oh, was that his question? I answered that. Oh, oh. what was the answer? Yeah, that's me. <laughs> oh. what, what was, uh, it's an easy answer. <laughs> what was your answer? Oh, my answer is I worked in uh, Unity mostly, and then I actually made Flash games back in the day, um, back when that was actually a thing, Minicliff and stuff like that, and most of them were personal projects, but I've also put together several hundred pages of documentation and um, illustrations and some animations and some rigging and things like that for uh, what's now becoming Dreamworld, which is really fun, uh, but it was mostly just small personal projects. By May 3rd, the information came to light that the Dreamworld Discord was actually being moderated by children. 14 and 16 year olds who Zach had recruited from Minecraft servers were confirmed to be two of the then four moderators on the server, who were consistently put in the firing line of angry consumers who were looking for answers by the two adult men that were in a position of power in the company. These children were put on the front line dealing with the customers and being the forward-facing public relations of the business with promises of potential future employment in a job of their dreams, including flying out the 16-year-old girl to California to intern at the company, talked about by Gary, as well as some particularly odd text interactions between Gary and the young girl, that could make some people uncomfortable to read in context. This came along with my own personal experience and with many others being banned from the Dreamworld Discord for seemingly no reason, people would question why the company was trusting children to do their moderation for them. Back as the game were being removed at an alarming rate from the Discord, which was the only place on the internet that had any information regarding the game that they had purchased, and they were losing that access due to asking simple questions that should have simple answers. Many of the content creators digging into the project had also been contacted by people close to families of Zach and Gary, and I won't speak for others, but I'd personally been told by multiple individuals that the reason Dreamworld as a game had managed to pass Y Combinator's notoriously difficult bar for acceptance was due to sheer nepotism, Gary's family being well-connected in Silicon Valley, and pulling strings to get their project greenlit for investor funding. So by this stage, a project had appeared by a serial entrepreneur who showed a propensity for lying, using a falsified sob story alongside his stoic friend who by all accounts is a talented software engineer, but is not a game developer. They propose a premise for a video game that they have zero hopes of building, with ridiculous claims of technological feats that are unheard of even from billion dollar industry veterans. A game that appears to be a Frankenstein's monster of Unreal Engine store code and assets, stitched together into an incoherent mess, and raising hundreds of thousands of dollars, potentially in the millions, from private investment using alleged fast-tracked connections to the prestigious startup accelerator, and then turns to the public to raise an additional $64,000 from what appears to be mostly children and those who simply don't know any better. Even if at this stage we assume that they are delusional dreamers who know no better, they are proven as liars in multiple instances, obfuscating any and all information possible, censoring opinions or questions they see as damaging, all the while using actual children as unpaid moderators both as a shield and a sword against the public, putting the kids in a position whereby they represent the company despite being not old enough to even be employed. Which, some people would argue, is not an issue, but all of this in context, it reflects extremely badly on your business to be using kids as forward-facing PR for your business, 
when you also admit that you have hundreds of thousands of dollars in investment. From this point on, we're going to go over the launch of the game's alpha and the subsequent incompetence on display from the developers, as well as them selling the game in such a ridiculous manner that it almost rivals parody. There are points in the story that I've had to double and triple check because I couldn't believe they were real, and not an elaborate attempt to troll the critics. But this is where the story gets less about the people involved and more about the actual game of Dreamworld, since most of the things relevant about Zack, Gary, and the supporting characters in the charade have been brought to light already. This is where it all changes. The Dreamworld Alpha is finally here. Alright guys, oh boy, welcome to a uh, horrible, horrible, horrible game. May 20th, 2021, Skiazos, a backer of Dreamworld and former champion for their cause, streams the first alpha of Dreamworld. He opens the stream by stating in a defeated tone, it's a horrible, horrible game. It is worse than people actually thought, which is really hard to accomplish when you consider that this video so far when I'm writing the script is almost 4,000 words of discussing the shocking incompetence and delusions of these so-called developers of this absolute eyesore. The multiplayer of the game makes everyone else appear as a floating sphere. The performance is so bad that if the game was more mainstream, people would likely replace the but can it run crisis meme with but can it run dream world. The game had almost none of the features they claimed it would have, including the pantheon they said would be in the alpha with all the backers names inside being completely changed and missing elements that they had even in the pre-alpha trailer. Buildings in the game were literally just cubes of white box instead of actual assets. The buildings that were in the game had zero collision, so you could just run through them all. Callum Upton on May 21st would reveal that the buildings that did actually appear in the game were yet again assets that were this time stolen from other creators without even paying for a license to use them in a game, which was something they'd already been caught doing previously with music by Callum in months prior. But you hear all of that and you think, well it can't get worse from here, right? Wrong. Welcome to Dreamworld. The game performed so badly that the asset field medics that were masquerading as developers had decided to add in a fog that would limit render distances for the player, but they didn't actually make anything on the client behind said fog stop rendering. So in reality, all this did was add a really ugly fog, further harming performance while making the already ugliest sin game look worse. And if you think we found the rock bottom, Dwayne The Rock Johnson would walk into your room and introduce you to the rock bottom that is Dreamworld Networking. To make a complicated process simple, Usually there are checks that a server will do to authenticate you actually did something to stop you just altering things on the client side of the program and it going through to the server. This is referred to as server side authentication. You will likely have played online games in the past where everyone was cheating in crazy ways using really easy out the box cheats like Cheat Engine, just changing values on their end and the server accepting them as fact. Well, that is what Dreamworld's networking is, the revolutionary keystone of the project that they claim was the solution to the industry search for fitting millions of people on one server is so basic that it doesn't even check if anything is valid on the server. To put it very simply, you could tell the server, I did this thing, and the client would say to the server, hey server, I did this thing, and it says, all right, yeah, you did buddy, good job. In a game where you are connected to said server with other players, this is an absolutely critical flaw, not just in terms of the playable experience and how it would be ruined, but in terms of the security of all players connected to said server. From here on in, this is all information that has been sourced from Callum Upton and his YouTube channel as he has been following along chronicling the updates of Dreamworld for the last three or so months since myself and Josh Trifes last covered the project. So this is where Josh's Dreamworld The Scam So Far video ends in terms of coverage and where we pick it back up. It would be impossible to go over each week in the complete depth of the update because the video would be over two hours long but I will try and hit on all of the key pieces. You would think at this stage things could not possibly get worse, and fortunately you are completely wrong. On June 8th, Callum would launch a video detailing the first ever patch of the Dreamworld Alpha, in which he goes through the patch notes and talks about each specific point, and marks off each one of them that was completely wrong or didn't work. The first update results in him showing that the features they claim to add would not work at all, the world healing they claim to patch in was being delayed and would be in the next patch, therefore was not relevant, the rotation system they said that they'd improved was completely unchanged, the load time improvements was just due to the fact that they removed assets from the world that users had placed, fixing the resource cheat which they didn't do as it was still possible within minutes of logging on to cheat the resources, 
adding a minimap which they bought for $1.50 on the store and still didn't manage to get it to work in multiplayer, added speedy sidewalks to the city but didn't change the speed values, and last but not least, the magnum opus of their patch would be fixing the Steam VR problem, which basically when you opened the game, it would launch Steam VR because it thought it was a VR game, which you fixed by unchecking a tick box. In this video, Callum also discusses a PC Gamer article that me, him and Josh Strife Hayes were interviewed for, in which they reached out to Zach and Garrison for comment on the allegations to which they replied simply, we do not have enough time to respond due to all team members working 80 hour weeks. Which of course means that that would be 320 hours of work per week for this team, and this patch was two weeks from launch of the client, which means they had 640 hours to put together an update they didn't do almost anything at all, although it is more likely that they did not spend those 640 hours in the game at all. Although there was another patch that week, which again Callum breaks down, showing that the patch notes were two tick boxes worth of changes, and a feature that didn't work as intended. But don't worry, because they added doors. The doors, of course, did not work. Last I checked, doors were supposed to open and close. However, Dreamworld's doors would just rotate 45 degrees on the spot when used. Callum shows in a video how easy it is to put together both the roads and the doors working correctly, and it takes him less than 5 minutes in total to make both of these function correctly in real time from start to finish with a stopwatch on screen. Meaning if you remove all the features they claim to add or fix, which they didn't, the two weeks of work that kept them busy for 640 hours was visibly to users both in function and by their own patch notes, were a few minutes of work at best, and even then, not done correctly, and in the laziest ways imaginable to the stage of not even working. June 15th, another week, and another dose of reality for anyone unfortunate enough to still believe these people would ever be competent enough to deliver anything except for unsettling laughter after every difficult question. I think he asked the question, one of your developers had like nine years of game dev experience and he asked for some proof and... Oh, was that his question? I answered that. Oh. Oh. What was the answer? Yeah, that that's me. <laughs> Oh. What, what was, uh, it was an easy answer. <laughs> what was your answer? This update includes my favorite game design choice, adding inconvenience to a game before there is even really a game to enjoy beyond said inconvenience. Previously in Dreamworld, you could carry infinite resources. You also could not die, so you could never lose those resources. So you could gather stuff and then just go and build, also known as the only two mechanics that the game actually has in it. Well, they added in a storage chest this week to the game that could be used to store resources, which of course you would not need since they cannot be lost and you can hold all of them. So to force you to use these chests for an arbitrary reason, they added encumbrance with numbers tweaked so badly that you could only carry enough resources to build two walls before moving slower. They did, however, manage to make deleting old assets refund only 50% of the resources. So that is the first change in these three weeks that actually worked as intended with all coding there to function, and didn't just come off the asset store as a purchase. They did also state that they improved FPS by 20%, though without clarifying for who and on what hardware this 20% would apply to, it means absolutely nothing as the game was already running extremely poorly on high-end hardware, but seemed fine on some lower-end hardware. Maybe the jewel in the crown, they also added a pause menu to the game when pressing the escape key, in a game that is multiplayer, and it doesn't pause the game, because it is multiplayer. They basically added in what mothers across the globe wanted to be added to our multiplayer games for decades so that we would come get our dinner the first time that she shouted and not have a back and forth about how we cannot pause the game because it is a multiplayer game. I have to believe for my own sanity that this was an elaborate joke. I think if I found out it wasn't, I would have to go and have a serious think about my understanding of the world and my place within it. They also made players not a floating sphere anymore. They are now the default Unreal Engine 4 mannequin which it was multiple months ago during the Kickstarter pitch, essentially just removing a change they made that for the life of me I can't figure out why they made it in the first place. But with this week's update would come a shocking revelation. Dreamworld might actually be trending upwards towards some real progress as a game. They brought two game developers on board from another dev studio called Gearstorm who Callum got a chance to speak to and confirmed they are real devs with the competence and experience to make a meaningful contribution on the project putting some of those apparent millions of investment to work finally. Now obviously everyone should be aware that regardless of two devs, 20 devs or 200 devs being hired, this wouldn't amount to them delivering on even 10% of the features that they had promised. They could not deliver a million players on a single server ever. It just is not possible. They could not deliver an MMORPG where you could just implement your own games and genres of games within it using development tools inside the Dreamworld client 
and make Dreamworld into every genre like they claimed, but maybe they could deliver at least updates that showed progress and didn't just exist as a slap in the face to the people who trusted them enough to give them money. On June 22nd, Callum was back to give us this week's update on Dreamworld, the cliff notes being that they added customization for the Unreal Engine 4 mannequin, which as you can see worked out amazingly. So amazingly, in fact, that people managed to add Zack's face to the game and were running around wearing his face on their character, which I have to say is absolute chef's kiss guys, well done. But just when people thought it couldn't get any worse, they somehow managed to do it. They added an in-game chat system, and as a chat system, you would need a unique identifier for each player so you could differentiate between who is who. They of course decided to display the second part of every user's MAC address, which is obviously a massive security breach and something that should never under any circumstances happen. They also added the game to itch.io, the popular indie game platform where you will find all kinds of weird and wonderful projects. Unfortunately, one of them is now Dreamworld and with a box price of $35 US. And that would not even be the worst part of this. The worst part, of course, is that the itch.io comes with a disclaimer that is longer and more concerning as a read than when I had to freeze my sperm. It is literally three paragraphs of huge disclaimers about purchasing the game, requiring you to adhere to all terms and conditions, content standards and community guidelines, telling you not to even download the game or install it if you do not agree to every one of them, as you will only get a refund if you have not used your access code already as well as to tell you at the bottom of those disclaimers that your $35 Dreamworld purchase only covers the alpha and not a single subsequent phase, which we can make a callback to earlier in the video. Remember when we talked about the developers being extremely evasive about their accepting of liability for a game beyond an alpha phase? As someone who covers alpha games for a living, I have never, ever seen a game go out of their way to disclaim so blatantly that they may not deliver anything beyond an alpha for their game. Imagine the confidence that you exude as a business owner by constantly reminding anyone who may purchase your product that you cannot guarantee the product's existence beyond the state it currently exists in. The itch.io page is also consistently the worst quality page I could find on the platform in terms of presentation, and I scrolled through the top seller section on paid games for a few minutes, and I only found one game that was $35, the rest were usually under 20 mostly $10 or less, so Dreamworld as it stands, a game that does not function in any meaningful way, that now has seven developers consisting in their own words of full and part-time employees, is charging $35 for an alpha, only an alpha, with no promise of future development, and even if there was promise of future development, they could just not give you access to it, or ban you for not adhering to their rules, which by the way includes such terms that literally every human being in the world could be banned for, on any given day, such as if you are annoying, cause anyone anxiety or to be upset, embarrassed or alarmed. Itch.io also has a handy little feature that shows the average session runtime of the people that purchase Dreamworld, and it literally says a few seconds. So the average that someone plays this $35 game is a few seconds, which you can see on other game pages actually works and shows a runtime of much higher, like half an hour for this game, Ratchet's Den, or again half an hour for Wolf Quest. And yes, it still does get worse beyond this point, still pertaining to the itch.io sales. This $35 game when purchased would generate a key for you to use, but the key that was generated was never saved. So users buying the game were just handed a key that didn't work, and then they had to enter the Dreamworld Discord to tell the developers if they were even able to and wasn't banned already, that this was the case, that purchases didn't work or get access to the game. And even if they did get access to the game, the developers uploaded the wrong launcher and the game didn't work anyway. So not only did you have to give them $35 for the game, you had to also complete Takeshi's Castle while blindfolded to actually log on. And once you did log on, your prize was Dreamworld the game, which is like if you went to the most expensive IMAX movie theater you could find, had to fist fight the loot goblin Bobby Kotick for a ticket, then defeat Quop on first try with no warm ups, and your reward as you sat down in your seat would be to watch the latest Steven Seagal movie while someone threw human feces at you. Meanwhile, Callum Upton would receive criticism from some in his community for picking on indie developers without being able to replicate what they had done so far. The typical, if you can't do it, don't talk about it. So he started his own project, which he dubbed Nightmare World, obviously is an inverse to Dreamworld, which in a short period of time had already gotten more functionality and features than Dreamworld, without spending a single penny and using only volunteers from his own community who were passionate about just making a game, although had never released a game themselves. On June 29th, the referral scheme from earlier is back. This time around, Gareth would announce anyone referring a friend 
would give said friend 30% off the itch.io purchase, a gift that they would surely thank you for once they were able to experience the wonder that is Dreamworld. Your friend would also get an in-game pet, once the pet feature was enabled, of course, which they also happened to promise for $2,000 to people who purchased on the Kickstarter in March, which had not yet been added to the game. By July 6th, the Dreamworld developers had introduced yet another measure to harm their own player base and justified it in a way that would cause people to scratch their heads. Previously, you would enter the key whenever you opened the game to get repeated access, and they added a new system whereby you enter the key once, and it is bound to your system hardware. Meaning if you change system hardware or wish to log onto a different machine, you simply cannot. Your game is now bricked, you have to buy it again, rinse and repeat. You change one piece of hardware on your computer, you can no longer get access to the game that you purchased. Garrison's reaction when asked about this is their solution will be accounts. But accounts don't fix everything since people can lose their passwords and confirming that they will move to it, but there is no such perfect system. Meaning until they do add accounts, you cannot play the game if you swap hardware or want to use the game on a different machine. An inconvenience that many would say would not exist if you just had accounts. And the argument of accounts not being great because you can lose your password is a bit of a head scratcher considering a password reset function does exist on almost all platforms that have accounts. They also accidentally unbanned everyone in the game because they tied bans to player names and then added an update that allowed players to change their names the week prior, which means that players like Callum and Skiazos, who were banned by the Dreamworld developers for placing too many assets in the game world, would log on and unban themselves by simply changing their names. They further went on to answer a question, what is Dreamworld, and would brag, quote, Dreamworld being the first open world creative sandbox MMO, with a multiplayer density of real world cities. Despite the fact that almost nobody plays Dreamworld as a game, and therefore there isn't a single city in existence on Earth that is less densely populated than the Dreamworld one, except maybe if we discovered Atlantis. However, by July 13th, the Dreamworld devs would remedy one of the largest issues facing their player base since the Kickstarter's success. They would add pets to the game. The pet inflammation was unfortunately less than ideal though, with it being just an asset pack they purchased and threw into the game. Essentially, it would assign a random pet to you each time you logged in. It would follow you around and vanish once you logged out, assigning a new random pet each time that you entered the game. Not exactly what the Kickstarter or the itch.io download promised for the promotion for recruiting a friend, especially since every user got one of these and not just a select few, as well as you could not choose which pet you had and they had no functionality. This update would also come with the most ridiculous stipulation yet in terms of giving this company your money and gaining access to the game that you paid for. The $35 box price of Dreamworld on itch.io would now require you to email Dreamworld developers with your real full name and address where you live, where previously you would purchase the game and get a pre-generated access code to log on and play like almost every other online service ever, they would add this additional step whereby they can gather personal identifiable information on users purchasing the game before they could download it. And they do not stipulate this anywhere during the purchase on the itch.io store page either. So upon purchasing the game, you would not get a key, you would instead get an email essentially saying, give us your name and address, or you cannot play the game you just purchased. And by July 27th, they had fleshed out the pet system more by purchasing around $100 of asset store pets and putting them in the game with over 50 to choose from. The people who paid $1,999 for Dreamworld on Kickstarter, of which there were seven of them, could choose 10 of these pets, which means they raised $14,000 for these packs and took multiple months to add in $100 of someone else's work to give to the players who bought them. As the $1,999 pack was the only one that had pets mentioned at all, this means $14,000 for $100 and a drag and drop feature. By this stage, you are caught up with all the shenanigans. The Dreamworld project so far has raised $64,706 from their Kickstarter, an unknown amount of money via their itch.io purchases at $35 each, and they have also raised a rumored $2.15 million via investment on Y Combinator, and since launch of the Alpha on March 20th, they have added almost no content, and what they have added has almost entirely been drag and drop content from the Unreal Engine store for small sums of money. They expanded their team from just Gary and Zach to include five other people for a total of seven, some of them being family members allegedly, and the project is no closer to delivering on almost anything they claimed it would do. It is speculated that the recent patches that they have been delivering have been ticking boxes on their Kickstarter in terms of backer rewards, the idea behind that being, if they deliver on all of those rewards to each person who purchased the pack, 
they would have no deliverables left for anyone to claim they didn't get what they paid for. Which goes back to what was brought up in this video twice now, the wording of the purchase for both Kickstarter and itch.io never promising a game beyond the alpha client that they have cobbled together. The Dreamworld story is not over by any stretch, and so the coverage will have to continue. But this is as comprehensive of a then to now as I could put together without including every minor detail of the development post-alpha launch, which were mostly unremarkable and insignificant. Thank you as always for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video enough to leave me a like and a comment to help get noticed by the algorithm Senpai, and a subscription to see more content like this in the future. I appreciate you all. I hope to see you on the next one. Check the links in the video description for my socials. Stay safe out there. We out. Peace.